Hey everyone, welcome to the Anexapod, the official podcast for Anexanet. This is episode 6 for August 24th, 2016. I'm your host, Ned Bellavance, Enterprise Architect for Infrastructure Solutions at Anexanet and Blitzkrieg Bop Pogo Official. Here on the Anexapod, we talk technology for the enterprise, covering infrastructure, app dev, analytics, and anything else that is shiny. On this episode, we will be talking about hyper-converged infrastructure, news from the AWS Summit, the release of PowerShell as open source, and I have a special guest from the Packet Pusher podcast and Ethereal Mind, the indefatigable Greg Farrow. As promised last episode, I've got some ranty goodness for this episode, so let's talk about hyper-converged infrastructure. In case you've been living under a rock, you might have noticed that hyperconverged infrastructure, or HCI, is a fast-growing segment of the hardware market. At least that's what all the marketing campaigns and analysts are saying. Of course, to a certain degree, this is derived from vendors pushing HCI very hard at the consumer and in the channel. I can't tell you how many briefings, webinars, and marketing campaigns I've been hit with about HCI in the last 12 months. Excessive is the word that comes most readily to mind. I want to pontificate a little bit about HCI and its place in the industry. The way that HCI is built, you would think it was a panacea for whatever ails your data center. Need more compute? Want to get rid of storage arrays? Need more automation? If you answered yes to any or all of these questions, then HCI is for you. The reality is that HCI is the right tool for some jobs, but by no means all. I see the main use cases for when... You are considering purchasing new hardware for a specific application. You are building a new data center and want a scalable solution. Or you are placing hardware in a rented rack and want maximum density. An HCI is not going to replace your storage arrays, at least not in the short term. Storage arrays are easily expandable with tiered storage types to meet your needs. An HCI appliance has a pre-configured amount of storage in it and you usually need to purchase identical nodes for storage replication to work properly. So expanding the storage in a node is a non-trivial affair. An HCI is also not going to replace all of your traditional dedicated servers, the ones that are not virtualized and aren't going to be anytime soon. While it's true you can basically virtualize anything you want, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should. HCI relies on a hypervisor, typically ESXi or Hyper-V, and virtualization to run all of its instances. If you have an exchange build-out following the preferred architecture, or an oracle rack on physical boxes, then HCI isn't going to virtualize and condense those bad boys. And HCI is also not going to reduce your network footprint, at least not any more than any other virtualization solution, and in some cases it will require a higher port density for your top-of-rack switches. For instance, an HPE C7000 enclosure with two Virtual Connect FlexFabric 2040 modules only really needs four 10 gig uplinks to your top of rack switches. C7000 enclosures are 10 U apiece with 16 half height hosts. An HC250 or a Nutanix NX3K has four nodes in 2U, so each 2U requires eight 10 gig ports. Load up 40U and you've got 80 nodes requiring 160 ports. Your rack density increases, but your port density increases even faster. So what do you get with HCI that's different from buying a blade chassis and a storage array? Well, first off, you don't need a storage array. This is converged infrastructure after all. Each node in the HCI has an identical amount of storage in it, and the contents of that storage is replicated to other nodes in the HCI environment. The value that an individual vendor adds to the equation is the software which handles that replication. The different replication technologies can be a key differentiator since they determine how much usable storage you actually end up with and how reliable or durable your data is at rest. Then there are questions of which ones support native encryption, site-to-site replication, data deduplication, and more. The second thing that HCI promises is the linear scalability of components. If you need additional capacity for a particular cluster, you just snap in an additional module and away you go. The key differentiator between the various HCI offerings is how truly simple it is to pop in another node, and what the caveats are surrounding node expansion. 
This mostly comes down to the hypervisor being used, the management overlay, and the automation layer. Which brings me to my last point. The final thing that HCI promises is simplified automation and end-user driven provisioning. That's not unique to HCI, and you can really do it with any platform. But since an HCI vendor controls the whole stack of components, they should in theory be able to bring some powerful automation and a programmable API. This is chasing the dream that already exists in the public cloud sphere with AWS and Azure. All of those public cloud providers are offering infrastructure as a service. The ability for users to provision resources for themselves through a portal or an API. The ability to monitor consumption. The ability for admins to create a library of complex, pre-built application solutions and provide them to the end user. And the ability to expand to web scale capacity in a linear and predictable fashion. That's the promise of hyper-converged infrastructure a nascent field with a bunch of offerings. Things are in their infancy, and I think it's all still shaking out. Will the best vendor be a software overlay on commodity hardware, or a tightly coupled software and hardware offering? I encourage everyone to look beyond the hype and see what the actual offerings add versus a DIY approach. On August 11th, AWS had their NYC Summit and announced a few new things. Kinesis Analytics is now GA, so you can query streaming data to your heart's content. Application Load Balancer can provide a little more flexibility over the traditional Elastic Load Balancer. You can bring your own key to AWS Key Management Service. And Snowball got a couple new features to help developers. With 60% year-over-year growth for AWS, they need to keep innovating like this if they want to sustain that kind of growth going forward. Azure Stack on OEM only. Microsoft's Azure Stack platform was released for preview earlier this year. Microsoft is now saying that the platform will not be customer installable and instead will only be available from OEMs like HPE and Dell. VJ Tiwari has explained this reasoning on a recent Channel 9 presentation, but the basics come down to consistency, update compatibility, and control of the hardware and software interoperability. Expect a basic stack to start at four nodes and scale up from there, and to be available sometime in mid-2017. Open vSwitch is now part of the Linux Foundation. Open vSwitch has joined the Linux Foundation, giving it access to the back-end resources to further development and more tightly integrate with existing Linux Foundation projects. I take this as a sign of the maturity of the platform as OVS becomes the de facto alternative to closed source virtual switch implementations. AirGap breached by disk noise. Just when you thought your AirGap server was safe, it turns out that researchers from Negev Cybersecurity Research Center were able to show a POC of transmitting data from a hard drive using the acoustic emissions of the actuator arm. A recording device running partner software could listen for and interpret the information back to usable data. Similar demonstrations have been done with the built-in speaker on system boards and controlling fan speeds. All of them require malware to be present on the target system. So if your hard drives sound a little funny on your air gap system, you might want to take a second look. And finally, Microsoft announced the open source of PowerShell and support for Linux and Mac OS. That's right, folks. Microsoft has taken another step into the open source community by open sourcing the entirety of the next version of PowerShell, aka PowerShell version 6. It's now up on GitHub, so you can take a look around at the C Sharp code, and maybe if there's a commandlet that's been bothering you for a while, not doing exactly what you want, you can modify it and then submit a pull request to get your uh, changes back into the official code that'll be distributed to Windows. That's pretty awesome. In addition, Microsoft has released PowerShell for Linux and for Mac OS. It's reliant on .NET Core for all of its functions and modules, so bear in mind that if the library's not in .NET Core and you don't bring it yourself, then it won't be available in PowerShell on Mac and Linux. In addition to basic PowerShell being available on those two operating systems, it was also announced that VMware and AWS are going to be working to bring their PowerShell commandlets and modules over to Mac and Linux as well. 
No longer will Linux be a second-class citizen when it comes to running PowerCLI for VMware or commandlets for AWS. Go Microsoft! Hey everyone, I'm joined today by Greg Farrell. Greg is what he terms an human infrastructure for data networking. He has over 25 years of experience in IT, with 12 years specifically in networking, and is a registered CCIE emeritus. Greg regularly hosts and contributes to the Packet Pushers family of podcasts and maintains his own blog at etherealmind.com. Welcome, Greg, to the Nexapod. I'm a survivor. You're 25, a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my 25 years of experience in enterprise IT, I actually call that a survivor of 25 years of corporate life. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree with that. I'm uh, I'm like <laughs> yeah. 15 years in now, and I another 10 years. I don't know. Yeah, yep, that to... screaming sound is your soul being sucked out <laughs> of your body. <laughs> I was wondering what that strange whining sound was in the background. I, I thought it was just feedback, but <laughs> no, good no. to know. That's your soul being crushed by uh, business process and uh, ITIL. And oh, the, oh. That, you, know. you don't have to say that word. I, I, <laughs> we're trying to keep this clean. We're trying to keep it family oriented. That's yes. right. I till. Oh. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, there's a big change brewing in network operating systems and uh, separation from physical hardware. It's, it's kind of like what happened with server operating systems back in the 80s when Microsoft decided to license their OS instead of making their own hardware. And that was kind of a separation from what Big Iron and Unix were doing, like Sun, IBM, and HP. Um, so what does this kind of disaggregation mean to the networking world? Yeah, sure. So I actually go back further. I can remember back in the 80s when we bought microcomputers. And we used to buy a microcomputer that did word processing, Wang word processors were the, day, were the state of the art in the day. And uh, you know the company called Singer that makes sewing machines? I'm familiar with it. They used to make mainframes and microcomputers. Really? And mini- yeah, yeah. You used you know, to be able to buy a Singer mainframe. One of their main factories is in Pennsylvania, not too far from me. It, All right. I see it on the turnpike. <laughs> there you go. Well, once upon a time, Singer was a, a, a manufacturing multi, multi-conglomerate kind of thing, a bit like General Electric. And they used to make computers, and there was lots of other different brands, and everybody had their own computer. And when you bought a computer, the operating system and the apps on the computer all came with. Harris Computers, you know, the, the list is, is rather long and endless. And uh, it wasn't uh, uh, entirely unknown for some people to have three or four computers on their desks, one that did word processing, one that did accounting, another one that did blah, blah. And uh, that obviously wasn't very sustainable over time. And what Microsoft um, and and back in the early days with its disk operating system or DOS or MS-DOS realized is that you could actually build a computer operating system pretty easily. It doesn't actually require much effort, actually as Linux has pretty much comprehensively proven over the last 30 years. And so it disaggregated the apps from the operating system from the hardware. So the server, you know, what was originally a monolithic stack bought from one company um, and involved CEOs going begging to the bank for a, you know, five-year or in some cases a 10-year finance deal became buy a server, buy an operating system, buy your apps, and they're just whatever they are. And networking hasn't changed largely since the model that model until in the last three or four years, and that is you always bought your networking product from a vendor, and inside of the product that you bought, it was the hardware with the operating system, and you got the features, the apps that were contained on that platform, and you had zero choice, the vendor um, gave you what they thought was good for the overall market. Now, this had, uh, in terms of networking, the, 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 the economics of networking made this possible, right? Because networking just wasn't big enough. Markets have to be of sufficient size uh, in terms of volume for disaggregation to occur. This concept of, you know, breaking an ecosystem into parts isn't isn't new. It happens in all forms of economic markets. It's a standard business thing. It's econo- economics drives it. It's just entirely some market starts out as custom made, then it, cut, it goes into small production runs, then it goes into large production runs, and then it becomes what we call commoditized. It become, Once the market is large enough, you can automate the production and make the hardware 
the software, the apps as separate things. So this isn't new. We've seen the same thing in cars, right? Do you remember? I don't know. You into cars, Ned? Um, enough to know what they do. <laughs> yeah. My, well, my, my general description of my car is that it has five wheels and a hole on the side that I put money in. But, you know, th- th- there was a time when cars were all made by Ford or, you know, General Motors or, you know, whoever it was. And then over the years, they decided that actually, why are they um, all in building engines and then developing their own one share engines? And then we could make less, you know, less different models of engines. Once we get an engine built and designed and tested and validated and safety rised and authorized and all that sort of stuff, why don't we just share it? And then we had Honda, you know, and Ford and all these companies sharing engines and in return that exchange gear tra- gearboxes and stuff. And this led to cars, to companies who just make gearboxes. Right. And then all of a sudden you found that Ford didn't make a gearbox. It might do some design, but there was a company over here that made gears and gearboxes and you know and and this is a normal practice in production so this process of disaggregation in it isn't specific to it that's the first thing to learn and the fact that networking is disaggregating isn't a reflection on the fact that our vendors have failed us it's not that anything went wrong it's just normal economic practice what we have is networking has reached the point where mass manufacture is now cheap largely due to to robotics and the fact that silicon production is stabilized and under control. And so now I can say, well, why don't I just buy the switch from vendor A, the operating system from vendor B, and the apps from vendor C? Hmm, That's that sounds, disaggregation. That sounds great. It also sounds like it adds some complication to the person who's administering all of that. Well, that's exactly what they said in the 80s when microcomputers, <laughs> <laughs> when you started using Microsoft uh, Windows or back in, say, the late 90s when Windows NT 3.0 came out. Everybody went, oh, you can't, this is never going to work. You know, like having apps that run on, that's just, that's just, you know, that's going to be a support nightmare. And of course, yes, it was for some time. It was a lot easier. We didn't know who to blame. We had white box, you know, servers quite often running Microsoft hardware and somebody else's apps and there was. But over time, these problems resolved themselves because customers wouldn't buy products if they weren't supported or if they didn't work. And the word got out pretty quickly. And you know what? In the era of the Internet, word gets out really quickly indeed. Yeah, faster than just about anything else I can think of. Well, then these days too, uh, a lot of us, like compared back to, you know, back in the 90s and the and the aughts when I was hanging around learning my trade, uh, we didn't go to conferences. We didn't have forums. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have social media. We didn't have blogs. It was all done on telephones, face-to-face, and uh, getting to a conference was something that just a blessed few ever went, you know, there was the interop conference and some some elite few would go to these conferences that you would never know about and and they would have access you know that that internet has completely changed the way we support our products in the last 20 years right it's not how many times do you just go and google something to get support instead of actually ringing a vendor oh daily i i <laughs> it's way faster than actually trying to get a vendor on the phone yeah. and going through level 1 and then through level 2 and then to level 3 where sure. you might get a call back in 4 hours have you ever wondered why tech support didn't get cheaper, though? Because they like, don't want you to call. <laughs> exactly right, but the price didn't get cheaper. If Google's helping you do all of that work, why isn't it that vendor tech support hasn't got cheaper? It's a good thought. Hmm. Mm. That, is, that is interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that's, so I, this disaggregation, I mean, the, the counter argument would be, well, my network needs to be rock solid. It needs to be stable. And now you're introducing instability by having hardware from this vendor and software from this vendor and maybe a third thing running from this other vendor. What's the yeah. counter argument to that? So there's two of them. One is, does your network really need to be that available? Like, do your servers? What about your cars? What about the building that you're operating from? Have you got a spare building right next to the one you've got in case it burns down? Not at the no, moment. <laughs> no, right? So, 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 so a lot of so first thing is this idea of of reliability or stability or pr- is 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 usually a load of it's a, it's a load of fool's gold. I believe you need to be very careful about how much money you spend on high availability or brand. Like a lot of people go with this branding idea. I'm going to go and buy a brand A, like you know Cisco or Juniper or Brocade or you know whoever it is, because I know and trust them to make a good quality product. But if in your personal life you go and shop at Walmart, LD, you know, like a low cost supermarket. Why are you not buying your networking products on the same basis? 
Right, and and if reliability, if a hundred percent uptime is really really important to your business, does your business actually have two buildings, one of which is empty and another one which is fully staffed, just in case the building breaks, or or do you have two CEOs just in case one CEO falls down dead, and you've got a spare one to back him up, right? Right. It, you need to be careful about the price of reliability or this price of stability. A lot of people. And in networking, we've never had that choice before, right? One of the mega trends that's going on in enterprise IT is this move away from ultra-reliable hardware to the reality, which is like you look at what Google and, and Amazon and Facebook and, you know, what I call the frangs, you know, fa- Facebook, ra- uh, Rackspace, Amazon, Netflix, Google. What they work is on the operating assumption that something in your network is going to break, something in your servers, your apps, everything's going to break. So if you work on the assumption it's going to break, you design your whole system so that it's ready with the expectation that it will fail at any point in time, right? First, right? So these people need a choice. They don't want hardware that's high price, branded. They don't need the Hermes handbag or the Chanel shampoo. Or that. What they want is a choice to have cheap because their app can fail. And so now they want a choice to be able to buy cheap, low-cost products because they're putting their money into changing their app to some other way. So for the first time in 30 years, customers have a choice to go with disaggregation and spend less capex. But the the flip side of that choice is you might – you're taking a punt and a reasonable punt, you take a gamble, that you might have problems down the line where you might need to provide your own OPEX to keep them running or to do some integration or some testing. Right. So plan for failure and just know it's going to happen. And- your business might run on a way of saying – I have the best quality of everything, and therefore I can trust it fundamentally to to run ninety nine point, well ninety nine percent of the time. My IT infrastructure will be up, uh, but you might also want to say if I designed my systems for failure, then what I want is low cost assets, cheap assets, no name brand switches, an operating system that I've tested that just does the things that I want. So, take for example, I can give you several horror stories where well known vendor products fail. In operation, where some features, like I once heard the story about a, a big chassis switch. It was running a mission-critical bi- uh, piece of business, and right at a key point in a demonstration, the, su- the switch failed. The primary uh, uh, chassis failed, and then it failed over to the backup one, which took over. But in that gap in the middle, that business lost literally hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was a very public failure. And they traced it out, and it turns out that it was a problem in the 802.1x code. They don't use 802.1x. So what I wanted, if I was running that network, I would actually not want my switches running all the software because in a proprietary version, they put all the features into one code and then ship it out. In an open version, I can take all that code out and throw it away. I don't want 802.1x. I don't use it. I only need that at the edge of the network. I don't need it in the core of the network, right? So I should be able to take it out, and that should increase my stability and my reliability. So part of this disaggregation process is moving from closed architectures to open architectures or inflexible static defined by somebody else for their own reasons to open i can make choices i can flex things around i could take things out that i don't want i can see into the process i can i can see what went into the sausage and that's something that we've never had before in networking and that all makes a lot of sense i mean uh, being able to have that modular control is kind of Mm -hmm. what a lot of the other parts of the application stack are about now. So like containers, you want to start with an OS that basically has nothing. Yes. And then load exactly the modules that you need absolutely Mm -hmm. to run your application and nothing else. Because that gives you reliability. Mm -hmm. Right? If you get Microsoft Server, for example, you get a kitchen sink. Oh and my spare goodness, boot. do you? You get all the, you get all of the, you know, you know everything, you know the third drawer from the top in your kitchen, it's always full of rubbish, right? Yeah, yeah like odd pieces of thing, like a, a roll of tape that's been there for like about a decade and a blunt knife and an egg slicer that you wish you'd never bought, but you can't throw it away because you, you're stupid enough to buy it in the first, you know, that sort of stuff, right? Microsoft Windows Server comes with the kitchen sink and the third drawer down. Right, there's just rubbish in there from 30 years ago. It's still able to run apps from 30 years ago, and that's part of the reason it's so insecure, it's so buggy, it's so unreliable. But- yeah, what's the base install is like 25 gig of yeah. stuff, yeah. and then every time you install a Windows update, it saves all the old versions, so you end up with like 20 gig of update backups. So why are we doing that? I 
it makes no sense. That's probably why they have Nano Server coming out because that gets rid of like ninety nine percent of that junk. Yeah, well, it comes down to it makes sense to productize. Up until now, customers have just said, "I want more, I want more, I want more," and customers have never said to the vendors, "I want less." I want simpler, I want dumber, I want the bare minimum I can get to get the job done. And so now what we're facing, what what Microsoft is facing, you know, and to a certain extent in networking too, is saying, I don't need all these features. I've got a network which is simple. I don't need all of the, you know, I don't need spanning tree or any of that rubbish that I used to use. That's all now pretty much obsolete. We can replace these with ECMP, leaf spine, high speed, low cost type stuff. And and how can I do this uh, at a price point, right? Uh, like, take, for example, one of the things we do in networking is when we buy these big vertically integrated stacks with the stability, you know, and you talked about, you know, I know where it comes from and blah, 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 all the features are there. But the problem is, is that we now have people who've got 15-year-old switches in their network core that can't be replaced. Right. And if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. You can't add new features. You can't move to the 10 gig. You can't move to the you know, the new faster switches with the extra features or modern routing protocols that, you know, all the enhancements like bidirectional forwarding detection or, you know, that sort of stuff. And those are things that you want, but because this design that you put in place 15 years ago, you know, is absolutely not flexible, not able to be replaced, well, now you've created technical debt. So you also need to be thinking about how do I dispose of my network? How do I start to treat my network components like they're printer cartridges? Right, swap one out and swap a new one in when you want a new feature. Yep, or how do, you know, in servers, it's quite common for customers to replace servers every, what, three to five years, five years max? Three years max these days. I mean, we're we're churning through pretty quickly. Right, why do we not replace our switches every three years? Uh, Because the the network admins I've worked with would throw a fit. (laughs) (laughs) And that's part of the problem, right? Once you train them in this mindset of treat your asset like a cherished heirloom, and you're Mm going to hold on to that for a decade or two. And and the answer is that most networking is actually rather fragile. It's very weak. It's subject to blowing up at, uh, you know, very little... (laughs) Sad to say this, really, but, you know, modern net, as a piece of human infrastructure, I know just how torturous, <laughs> I know how torturous this stuff really, really is. It's not fun to own a network and to run one when it's so fragile. Things can go wrong. Spanning tree can just loop out for no apparent reason and, and blow a layer two domain. The blast radius is phenomenal, right? Your entire data center, entire campuses can go down with an L2 bridging loop. Or if you have a routing flap, you can take down the entire WAN until you can unstuck it, you know. Um, that's why they were... Now, we are stuck with these designs for lots of deep technical reasons, like this design architecture capability, right? But what we did was our reaction to this was to try and build design architectures that lasted for a decade or two. But we're now moving into a situation where my servers are being rotated every three years. My apps are being rotated, coming down from 20 years to 10 to 5 to moving to the cloud, and all of a sudden, I've got to change the way I'm, the network is really, in a very realistic way, being forced to look at itself and say, this isn't working out the way we wanted. We absolutely need this gear to be replaced on a regular basis. So it sounds like you're, you're talking about a new modern data center approach. And I know the traditional model was that three-tier access distribution core layer but that seems to be going away. And I think you said spanning tree is dead. Yeah. Um, so we now have these layer two. So what we have is leaf spine or another word for it is ECMP, equal cost multipath, which involves a, a different, it's it probably not so, not a verbal picture that I can go here. But if, if you're running a three-tiered classic CCNA, CCNP trained architecture, that is very much in the legacy. So for those people who are designing the next generation of technology, they are very much looking at this and going, that's not the way forward. What we now build is networks that have a lot of ports. Well, the, the flip side here too is, of course, is that in the data center in particular, how many 10 gig ports do you actually need to connect to your servers, right? So I, it, it, Two, probably. Two, two per server. And if you're using a blade chassis, maybe four although I don't recommend blade chassis. I think they're vastly overrated. But, you know, if you have a server with two 10-gig ports. Now, if, if you've got a customer who's got, say, 20, 20 good-sized servers, let's say something like a Dell R, you know, on, on 10 or something like that, um, how, many, how many VMs can you run on one of those, do you think? 
Oh, geez, over 100 easily. Over 100. Right? We yeah. don't normally run 100 because if one of them flames out, we lose 100 servers. Yeah, you're in a little bit of pain. In a little bit of pain. Happens. But that's yeah. not, that doesn't mean it can't be used for that. It just means you've just got to be a little bit careful about how many you run on a single server. But let's say you're running 25 per server. If you've got 20 servers and 25 per server, then all of a sudden you've got 500 VMs. You yeah. can connect, right? So if you're fully virtualized in your data center, 500 VMs is going to cover 80% of companies or more in the world today. So you don't actually need a three-tier design to support that. All you need is two switches. Two switches? Yeah. Well, for two all the 10 gig ports, right? Yeah. Well, if you've got 20 servers, that's 20 ports on the left, 20 ports on the right. If I put two 48 gig, 48 port switches, 48 10 gig ports on the top, then I've still got 28 ports spare on each switch. And then what I'll use some 40 gig ports to interconnect them together. Maybe I'll use some 10 gigs as well. It doesn't really matter, whatever. But, you know, I've got plenty of ports spare for whatever growth. And 20 servers, 25 VMs per, that's 500 servers, and all I need is two switches and they're only half used. Yeah, that's uh, that's a lot less gear than you needed uh, 10 years ago, for sure. <laughs> well, you know, there was a time there when people would get wiring six, eight, or even 10 one gig ports per server. And when you do that, you have this great fan out at the edge where the servers connect. Remember, we used to have one for the vCernel and one for the uh, vCenter, and then we'd have another one, two for the data and, you know, storage and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Ten- entirely too well. Uh, I, I still have people <laughs> argue with me that you need all these additional one gig ports to separate out your networks. And I'm like, no, no, no. You can just That's why we have converged network adapters yep. and 10 gig and VLANs. You can do it all with two ports. You can. You very much can. The reasons that we did the old thing was not because we actually needed it. It was because one gig wasn't quite enough bandwidth for servers to cope. So if you wanted to do vCenter or if you had storage traffic, it was very easy to overrun a one gig from a server over the last three or four years, especially as the power increase, the CPU increase, not power, uh, although power did increase in servers substantially. But um, we couldn't quite make one gig ports work even if we channelized them and m lagged them and all that sort of stuff it just didn't it was too hard to do link aggregation and then to do multi chassis link aggregation was a incredibly difficult thing even today multi link uh, multi chassis link aggregation is highly unreliable and really isn't recommended for most people there are circumstances in which it can work but fundamentally multi chassis lag from from server to switch is deeply uh, is a, is still a major major problem uh, but, you know, think about it. The only reason that you've got 6 to 10 is because of the bandwidth limitations of 1 gig. When you get to 10 gig, not too many apps are actually generating more than 10 gigs worth of data. So you'd be lucky if they could do a gig or two. So if you're doing a vCenter while an app is going full run, 25 servers are pulling, what, 100 megs each, 200 megs each, you've still got plenty of overhead. Looking at the stats coming out of VMware or any real hypervisor, the network is never the bottleneck. It's, well, honestly, almost it's always disk. Disk IO is, t- is too slow on the SAN back end, but yep. yeah, it's, it's never networking. It was. Now, with the SANs changing to SSDs, that's changing too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's pushing, pushing that bottleneck somewhere else. <laughs> it is, and the network is part of that. But again, still, even so, when you're rewriting from a flash array or from a distributed storage system, so one of the networks I work on, uh, they have. Uh, we built a, a network uh, out of Mellanox switches in this case, and it has over um, 1,500 10 gig ports presenting towards servers. And in those 10 gig ports, it connects to a, a multi petabyte storage array. It's about 15 petabytes of storage in distributed storage systems. So what that means is, I think last time I checked, there was about 80 servers just full of hard disk drives presenting these storage units forward up, right? Mm. And uh, those engines, even when they run flat out to flash caching and and long-term disk storage, they are uh, still only pulling a terabit per second over those uh, 800 10 gig ports that feed into that array. So a terabit per second across 800 10 gig ports will give you an idea of the overload. Right. It's not using that much bandwidth. Right. Yeah, so two 10 gig ports, that seems to be uh, about all you need. And I say, it is. So, now, and uh, there, don't forget that down the pipe in networking, we also have um, uh, 25 gig and 50 gig. Now, you can buy a switch today. Again, if you could throw your switch away and just treat it like a printer cartridge, you can buy a switch based on the Broadcom Tomahawk, and it has 
uh, 48 ports of 10 slash 25 slash 40 slash 50 slash 100 gig on it. Is anybody using 40 gig at this point? Like realistically, aside from switch to switch? Uh, so so the, the long storage there is 40 gig was built in an era when the maximum clock rate we could go on an Ethernet channel was 10 gig. Okay. So one 10 gig Ethernet was the clock rate and you use one pair and you send a signal down one 10 gig. The first generation of 40 gig was actually to then use four pairs. In other words, four by tens. Mm -hmm. And then they used a wave division, or they used a a multiplexer or a wave division multiplexer inside of the head shell to turn those four by tens back into one by 40 gig. They used a SIRDES inside the chip. The second generations, now that's that's exactly how 40 gig works today. Still a 10, 10 gig clock rate, but four 10 gig channels. That multiplexing function costs a lot of money not just in terms of manufacturing and design, but also in terms of power consumption for 40 gig ports. We have now uh, the IEEE, which is the body who owns the 802.ethernet standard, have just recently uh, ratified the 25 gig. The 25 gig is instead of clocking the data at 10 gig down the wire, they're now clocking it at 25 gig. And the advances in the circuitry, the NICs and you know all the gear, the head shells, the coax cables and all that sort of stuff, so you now have this 25 gig. So now if I take two 25 gig channels, what have I got? 50 gig. And right? if I've got four 25 gig channels, I've got? 100 gig. So it's it's kind of the same thing as the 10 gig to 40 gig. but yeah. So 40 you're... gig is, so the, the deal is, is that 25 gig by 2018 is expected to cost the same as a 10 gig port. But 40 gigs will always be two and a half times a 10 gig port or 25 gig port because of the cost of the multiplexer. Okay. And from a cabling standpoint, will you be able to use the same like fiber cables to carry a 25 gig? Uh, yes. So functionally, uh, if there's one piece of advice I could give people out there in networking is to stop using RJ45 and CAT6 or CAT5 or whatever. That's just silly. If you're in a data center now, just use what they call it, which is coaxial cables. Um, so, so what we do when we make an RJ45 is we actually try and – get the signal to go down a pair of cables on the RJ45 cable, right? And then when we do it at 10, when we do RJ45 for uh, 10 gig, we're still doing 4 by 2.5 gig channels because you can't drive the, the um, that's why you need a cable with eight, eight cores in it or four pairs in, in 10 gig. But the actual electronics that drives that is right at the edge of what's possible with copper. And it's going to be possible to do 25 gig on copper, but it's going to be limited to about five meters. There's another cable called a coaxial cable or an active coax cable. They run um, five meters, but they're much more reliable. They're not suff- they don't suffer from the same weaknesses that RJ45 cable. The RJ45 cable, the head shells wear over time. Or if you hang them, do you know how your cables over time, you just hang them at the rack? Do you know gravity actually stretches that copper over time and causes them to break? Huh. I've never seen it, but no. that, that's well, that, interesting. So literally yeah. when you hang so – if you hang a copper cable from the top of the rack to the bottom, right? so it's a, that's a three-meter run from the top of the rack to the bottom. Think how much mm-hmm. gravity is pulling on that. And where is that stress – where is that pull, that constant tug? Where is that being held? And sometimes that's actually being held inside the RJ45 connector where they slice into the copper to make the connector, and that's why mm. cables fail. That's one reason why cables fail. There are others. Right? People trap them indoors or stand on them. Or, <laughs> you know, what? Yeah, I, I've never uh, stood on a cable. Yeah, so one of the big <laughs> reasons that you put uh, cable into cable management trays is because sometimes gravity breaks cables, among other, you know, there's lots of other good reasons, but that's one. Um, so copper, you know, the old um, UTP copper, that you should be thinking about just stopping that. Don't, you can now buy coaxial cables. They slot straight home into the SFP module and they go straight to the other end. So no patch panels, no intermediate systems, and they're much, much, much more reliable than RJ's. Yeah, I, I don't care for running RJ45 myself. Um, I actually really like fiber when I can do it because mm. it's so much thinner and easier to run. It bundles nicely, um, mm. but well, it's expensive. Well, the fiber optic transceivers are still expensive. Yeah, there is uh, coming again. Coming up in the future, uh, there's the long lost hope of uh, what we call silicon photonics, which is today we we actually put lasers inside the SFP modules, right? And they, we have to build up a full on array. Now, 
the the multi mode lasers actually sometimes use LEDs or they're very low cost lasers, and the the single mode are actually a full on you know class one type laser. Um, they're just not powered enough to cause you too much damage. You know, it's the old story: don't use don't look into the uh, into the fiber optic with your one remaining eye. <laughs> is that, is that <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so, so, so what you want to be able to do is um, instead of actually building a separate laser and then powering it and driving a signal and going through a signal generator and all that sort of stuff, it'd be really good if we could build that laser straight onto a silicon chip. So that at the same time as we make the chipset that drives the SFP, like every um, single f- the SFP that drives it actually has a processor on it. Right? It's actually a little networking chip inside of that SFP head shell. Did you know that? Uh, I, I thought it was something like that because it's got to convert the light to copper or to electric somehow, right? No, no, no. There's actually a computer oh, inside more of the shell. Yeah, there's okay. actually a – what most of those computers are actually doing signal transmission and they're actually dynamically modifying the signal trans, especially on RJ45 because RJ45 cable is so unreliable and so weak and subject to change over time that you actually have to do signal processing end-to-end between it to keep it stable over the life of the use. Um, but over – um, and these computers actually help to do the signal transmission and monitor the circuits and blah, blah, blah. And they have serial numbers and software in there as well, right? That's why when you buy brand A and you plug it into brand B and brand B says that's not my certified, authorized, blessed by virgins and secret priest or priest rights, you know, inside of a temple um, and then charge you five times extra for it. Um, you, you, it's, there's software in there that's actually key. Sometimes there's actually crypto certificates in there and they're actually matching up as well, which is a bit of a scummy thing. Right. Yeah. I, I've run into that with uh, putting unauthorized SFPs into a Cisco switch and it gives me the blinky amber to let me know. Yes. Mm. No, 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 no. I'm not Cisco. Yes. Well, it knows that because there's actually a little computer in the head shell. Okay. Right. And the software in there can be reprogrammed. So what you can do is go and uh, talk to the company that sells you the SFPs and make sure you get them to give you – it depends on how you want to do it. When you buy third-party uh, SFP modules, you're buying exactly the same product that the vendors use, right? There's sometimes there's a quality difference because the vendors actually enforce quality restrictions. But if you deal with a, a, a quality OEM SFP manufacturer, you'll be fine. Uh, and they will give you a, you can order them and say this SFP belongs in this switch, and they will pre-program this firmware in the head shell so that it operates in your switch. Uh, some people actually have the reprogrammer, the programming thing themselves. So what a lot of big companies do is they actually have uh, you can buy the boards that do the reprogramming and you literally slot your SFP or your head, you know, whatever type of head shell, CFP or, you know, GBIC, whatever it is. You slot it in and then you tell it, load the firmware to it. And then you go and put it in the switch and it won't tell you that it's not genuine. Wow, that's sneaky uh, and should be unnecessary, but I'm glad to know yes. it's out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I read somewhere once that something like uh, 30% or 40% of profits in networking vendors actually comes from the sale of sfps right now it's just free money like these things cost cost like a few dollars to to manufacture and sell and the vendors are, are charging hundreds it's, it's one of those rip-off markets i actually get quite upset about it because it's not innovation it's not right. it's not earned money like if they were giving me value in that product but all they're doing is buying the product from someone on the right and using their um incumbent position with the customer to overcharge them it's not a it's not a pleasant business in that sense so all the more reason to go to uh to a white box with uh whatever os you you want on there right i I think so i mean think about it you know it it, the the, we're now in an era where software matters more than hardware now partly this is because um hardware's gotten to the point where remember i talked about that that switch which is 10 25 40 50 100 Mm -hmm. and it can actually it has 6400 gig ports inside of it and then you can break them out into 10 gigs and 40 gigs just by a breakout cable it's quite exciting um if you think about it if you've got that you probably won't need a switch for the next decade because that's all the 10 gig ports you'll ever need like 100 gig port can break out into 10 tens or 425s or 250s or 240s you know blah, blah, depends on which breakout cable you buy so that's just a lot of ports and a lot of bandwidth like these things are close to non-blocking so what you really want now is to turn your eyes away from speeds and feeds, as we call it, how fast does the switch go, how many ports does it have, what power does it consume, to the software features that are inside it. And the question is, what software features do you need, but more importantly, what software features don't you want in there to get the reliability out of the switch? If the only thing you're running is VMware, which is common for many enterprises, 
then the only thing you might want is some really simple L3 routing in that core switch. Why not just buy a, a device that has just that layer 3 routing? None of the other stuff, none of the DHCP snooping. Maybe you don't even want a digital one. Maybe you don't want private VLANs. Maybe you don't want BGP. Maybe you don't need OSPF or ISIS. Maybe you don't need any of the other thousand features that are in the switch that you got and you paid for, by the way. Maybe you just don't want any of that. Or maybe you do. The thing here is you've got a choice for the first time. So how do you how do you get from the traditional model that you might have in place today? Say it's more of like a brownfield situation yeah. to the newer model. What's the sort of uh, transition between the two? So here's how I normally say to people: is don't try and change what's working. If you if you go to the boss and say we've got to throw the network out and buy a new one, he's going to look at you and go like, but my car's running fine. Right. Right. Sure, it's a 10-year-old, it's a banger, and it you know needs new tyres, and the, the outside's a bit dented and everything, but I ain't going to replace it until it's broken. So what you've got to do is look for what I call the patch of green. A data centre doesn't have to have one network. In fact, your data centre probably doesn't have one network now. You've probably got one for servers, one for the WAN interface, one for the DMZ that faces towards the internet. You might have a management network for out-of-band administration of all the servers and all the switches and the firewalls. You might have a production and a pre-production. So if your company's up for a certain size, you've probably got a pre-prod and a production network. Your data centre isn't one network. So start thinking about, that's my 2016 network, and over here is my 2017 network. And on connected to my 2017 network is my 2017 server farm. And over here is where I'm going to put my 2018 switches and my 2018 server farm. And then I migrate my VMs from one to the other as the years go by and then just start tossing out the old printer cartridges out the back. That sounds like a pretty good plan, and especially, like you said, with VMs. Yeah. It, it does make that migration of at least mm -hmm. the applications and the, and the virtual servers you know, relatively painless, right? Um, well, think of it this way. If you build a – let's say you have a rack of gear and that's your 2015 model, right? And then you build your 2016. Maybe for the first three months of the year, you you know, you get the switches in, you get the servers in, you get the apps up, you get your VMware, you get your vCenter. And then you start migrating your VMs across, say, from April until October. Everybody's up, storage array's done, blah, 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 new storage array in, VMs are migrated one by one all year, Right. And then at the end of the year, you sh stop the migration, so you get into, say, like October timeframe, and then what you're actually doing is starting to build the 2018 version. Right. And it's just so it's this, just like a farm, right? Mm -hmm. And the far I, I plant the seed, I grow the seed, <laughs> I reap the seed. <laughs> and then the next year, I go around and do it again. I mean, that's a... That's a that's a different model of IT, but don't. One of the challenges that we have is we say, "Oh, it's so hard to do these apps and things break." You know, the thing is, the, the less you change things, the harder they are to change. Oh, don't I know it? The the number of legacy systems that I've had to continue support for when I'm going out to a client, you know, they still have Windows 2000 running, and they're like, "Oh, but it runs this one app, and it's got to stick around." And I'm like, "It's time to just rip the bandaid off." I mean, you've, <laughs> you've, you've you've pushed it out as long as you can. Yeah, that's right. And the thing is that until till the vent, you know, until it actually breaks, it's, it's that like, the same as that. Remember that car I talked about, and the boss is running a ten-year-old. I mean, it depends on which you know country you're in. And I don't live in America, so I don't actually know the names of the cars over there. That matter. But if you're driving around in a Lada and it's fifteen years old and it coughs and it splutters, but you know it's working, why would you replace it? You drive it a little bit longer. And, you know, and, and this goes back to my point about you know why do you want reliability when you're running this crappy old app? <laughs> the app that crashes on its own yeah that's right so, so why are you overspending on these high quality products you know I, I have this thing about enterprise it it talks about you know mission critical and blah 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 and in reality actually only there's just a very small part of your network or of your data center that actually matters probably two or three apps the rest of them are like yeah you know if email goes down for 20 minutes does anybody notice uh not as many as you would think mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when we're going through the DR exercise with people trying to get them to build out a list of applications. And that, that's when you really figure out, okay, what, what's the application that actually makes you money? What, what's the one that you absolutely can't have down? And what's the one that's just your pet project that we can kind of push to the wayside? Yeah, that forces them to make some real decisions. Uh, until then, everything's, you know, priority AAA, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then as an as a, as a IT professional, I think we just have to start being a little wiser about 
spending company money by saying, really? Like, you know, really? Like one of my favorite things is to walk into a, a customer for the first time and look at the cars in the car, in the car park and judge, you know, how many people are driving high quality, brand new, latest model cars because that's the most reliable. I don't know if they're driving it because it's the most reliable or it's just the flashiest and the prettiest, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, my point, I think my point is, you know, I make my point and I stand on it. Damn <laughs> okay. you. No, there, is, there are people who just want to look good, but I don't think anybody buys a data center just to make it look good. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we, yeah. We've sold some, some data center equipment. I'm like, you, you do not need that. You know, 60 gig going to one server. You you don't need that, but it looks good and it sounds good when they're talking to the investors. So they like to keep it there. I uh, said, so, "All right, that does happen, but I think that's the exception rather oh, than yeah. yeah, rather than the rule." I guess I, I think we're seeing a much more pragmatic, and you know, the, I think we should realize that in the data center for most companies there is a rack of blessed, you know, special special privileged assets that are actually mission critical, but increasingly. 50 to 70% of what's in your data center can be sent off to the cloud for a lower level of service, mm. then maybe you need to be starting to think about building that lower level service inside of your data center. Yeah, you can certainly, if you play your cards right, you can do it pretty cheaply too. Mm. Like cooling, here's my favorite topic. How many compu- how, how many people chill their computer room? Well, every data center I've been into, I need like a, a parka yeah. to work, right? Yeah. Do you know why? It's- uh, well, because the chips have to stay cold, right? If they go above a certain degree, they just explode. <laughs> Actually, yeah. But uh, Google, for example, runs the temperature in their data centers just a shade over 30 degrees. That seems a little warm. Yeah. But, but in fact, any sort of modern the, – the reason is, is back in the days of mainframes, like way back in the days in the 60s, the cooler you could keep it, the better it would perform, literally. It was to do with the way transistors and things worked. Okay. And nobody's actually sat down and thought about what's the right temperature for a data center. And in 2016, if you're running any equipment, mostly if your equipment was bought in the last five years or maybe the last 10 years, you can run your data center at 30 degrees, no problems at all. And uh, there's various research papers from Google showing that their reliability does not change um, uh, up to over 35 degrees. And I think they're doing about 30 degrees as a safety buffer today. In fact, Google's gone a whole step further. They use machine learning on their data center to do the thermal loadout and to save power and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I, just thought I, I, I heard about that, that they hooked up their deep deep AI to, mm. to look at it, and they've reduced their power consumption by something like 40% over uh, mm-hmm. last year. That's right. So if you think, you know, simple things like you don't actually need to chill your computer, you just need to keep it below 30 degrees. If if you did that, imagine how much money you'd save. A, a significant chunk. I know when yeah. we're we're trying yeah. to make that cost justification argument for mm-hmm. less less computing hardware, power mm-hmm. and cooling all factors into it. For example, Dell actually makes room temperature equipment, so that means up to sixty degrees C. It'll operate fine. You actually need zero cooling for that stuff. You just vent the hot air straight outside. Wow. Right. That's yeah. storage and compute and network. They have a whole special set of assets called room temperature. Um, go and ask your Dell rep. I'm sure he'd be delighted to talk to you about it. But uh, you don't actually, you know, 60 degrees C, I mean, that literally means all you need is a ventilation system that sucks in air from the outside. You'll need to filter it to filter out dust, but that's not, and you'll need to change those filters on a regular basis, right? Part of the reason we recirc the air in a data center is to reduce the dust. Right. But if you're sucking in air from the outside, your problem becomes um, cleaning those dust filters on a regular basis because it's not part of a six-monthly or a yearly service that you get on your internal ones. It's actually much more frequent, like monthly. Uh, but then you just vent the air back out the other directly out into the air, and then they'll cool. Done. Wow, that's that's a pretty big shift in mindset from you mm-hmm. know the data centers I go into where. Yeah, my my hands get numb after a couple hours. Yeah, you just got you got to step out and just stand in the sun to. It's warm usually up. the sign of a customer who isn't thinking clearly about their data center. They normally just uh, this is this is the temperature, and you say why is it the temperature? And they go because it is the temperature. That's because we we know best. And you go, but the research shows that that's not necessary. And they go, but but that's not what we do. You know, that's I think very difficult to change, but that's the reality. I, yeah. I have uh, customers very successfully running servers. Just go back to that 20 server argument again. You can probably fit that into a rack in a closet. Yeah, easily. 
you could have a data center built into a into a back to where we were in the in the mid nineties, where we were literally building data centers in broom closets. Yeah, I've seen a fair amount of those. Mm. Um, I gotta say, what yeah, what we've been doing the hyperconverged thing a little bit, and with those, yeah, you'd get ten or fifteen of those, hook them all up to a switch. You don't even have a separate SAN or anything, mm-hmm. um, and you've got tons of compute storage power. Uh, to to do what you need to do, so one rack and you're done, basically. Yes, yeah, one rack in there's all the storage and everything you need. Even if you're buying a, a pretty good sized uh, flash array these days, you're talking about a power consumption that's one tenth of the old disk drive arrays, mm-hmm. uh, speed that's like you know hundred times greater, and can fit into a quarter of a rack for you know hundreds of terabytes or even up to a petabyte. I think a half. Uh, I want to be careful here. You could certainly get a several hundred terabyte flash array in a quarter of a rack. Yeah, and it's not going to weigh three tons. So, yeah. you know, crashing through your data center floor into the people below you. Or reinforcing your floor. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully reinforcing before I've that happens. I've had to happens, do that right? more than once, yes. <laughs> yeah, as have I. Yeah. Wait, wait. What do you mean the, this VMAX weighs three tons? <laughs> oh, all right. Better go get the, go get the braces in. <laughs> yeah, that's always fun. Yes. So with all these shifts and changes in networking, um, how should a network or systems admin sort of be preparing themselves? Because obviously they're going to need to learn some new skills. So, so what, what avenues would you, would you push people to go down? Ooh, training. If you're trying to imp- – so it, how do you develop? How do you professionally develop? Um, one of the things that IT lacks is the ability to do continuous learning. That is just keeping up with the industry or following trends or predicting the future. Um, there are no good answers. I mean, if you're interested in a lot of the ideas that I've spat out here, um, they're, they're, they're littered through the podcast that we do on Packet Pushes. We have four different channels. We publish four shows a week. There's an awful lot to listen to. So maybe that's not such a great idea, um, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, it's, it's drinking from the fire hose a little bit. But it is. It's maybe. worth it. Yeah, subscribe, have a listen. Maybe not every show is for you, but there are some, uh, particularly in our Future of Networking series uh, and in the Data Notes, which might also, we have a particular channel called Data Notes, D-A-T-A-N-A-U-T-S. You can find it on iTunes and there's various subscription options on our website. And those uh, Data Notes is much more cloud-centric or, you know, silo busting across the whole spectrum of virtualization, orchestration, Git, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, whereas packet pushes, the more traditional packet pushes like the weekly show or the, the priority queue or the network break, they're much more networking centric where we look closely at those. You could listen to those and that's what, sort of where uh, I spend my life full time peering into the future of enterprise IT. And that's where a lot of these ideas come from. Uh, in terms of following others, I would start reading people's blogs. Blogs are where people are talking about the things that other people aren't talking about. Like if you're a journalist with a liberal arts degree, how much do you actually understand about enterprise IT infrastructure? Not very much, I would imagine. No, generally what the <laughs> vendors can give them in a nice presentation and they can turn into a nice story, a Cinderella-style story or a Shakespearean story that has a start, a middle and an end. Uh, so, so no, you know, there is value in knowing what the industry shifts are, but start listening to podcasts and finding blogs or people who are, you know, again, remember what I said about the internet earlier? Get closer to professionals who are doing this in the real world. F- get onto Twitter, follow some Twitter accounts. I know it can be distracting, so you'll just have to be an adult and a grown-up and control your behavior. <laughs> but, but you, you, know, um, you know, there's definitely, uh, it's out there. You just have to go and search for it. And you've got to want... It's the old joke about the light bulb. You know, how many, how many psychiatrists does it take to change the light bulb? Just one, but the light bulb's got a want to change. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that one in mind. <laughs> Sorry, that's really so, yeah, cheesy. No, um, that's my worst you, dad joke ever, I think. I love it. Uh, <laughs> a da- as a dad myself, um, yeah. I'll make sure to tell that when the kids get old enough to actually understand it. <laughs> That's what I say to people who say, but we've got to change. I've got, ah, but you've got to want to change. Oh, you do. Yeah, and you mentioned the Data Knots podcast. Um, I've really been enjoying that. I've actually been listening to it. And um, recently, I think you had Scott Lowe on there. Yes. And uh, he is just super sharp. And uh, he's got a whole vision for like the full stack admin. And to me, that really resonates. Like, yes. that makes total sense. You can't just drill into one very specific thing and have that be your thing. Because eventually that thing's going to shift and change and go away. Yeah, so there's a school of thought here about how your skills should look, right? And for mm-hmm. the last, um, 
for the last 30 years in IT, it's really been about what we call I-shaped skills. You pick a skill and you go very deep into it or silo-shaped skill. But um, nowadays, and then over the last uh, the last five years, we've seen the development of what we see as trident-shaped skills. That is, you might have one skill which goes very deep, but you've got sideways, uh, you've got skills in the adjacent uh, areas around you. So, for example, for, I've been doing quite a bit of work in storage and coming up to speed around servers because as a networking person, guess what connects to the network? servers and storage right and you want to keep some skills around the operating so you start to have these shallower skills in adjacent capabilities but what's happening in this devops net ops you know software as infrastructure as software software defined infrastructure blah 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 being a deep networking expert is still can be a career choice but you're more likely to have a successful long-term career by having shallower skills across a much wider base so Knowing storage, knowing some Puppet, knowing some Chef, being able to do some Bash and some Python, knowing how to write a web app and knowing something about servers and internets and firewalls, and but not necessarily being deep in each because in any given situation, you should be able to go and find the deep knowledge that you need from somewhere else. Right. There, there, you are going to be able to find – you are going to be able to find that expert who – who knows it all the way down into the little bits and bytes, but being able to know how to find that person and that you need to find that person, that's where that sort of generalized skill set comes in really handy, at least for me. Yeah, maybe if I had a wide range of skills across a much wider capability. And the flip side of that is your career becomes much more secure because you're not betting on networking servers, Windows, Linux, EMC, Cisco, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. I talk to other people and they're worried that they have to all become developers. They're like, but it's DevOps and I that means I have to learn how to code and, and, and write these, you know, intricate constructs and I'm like, No no, calm down. Yeah. Knowing a little scripting is probably important. But you don't need to sharpen get out your C sharp or, or, or whatever programming language book from your comp sci degree. You just learn a little bit more than the one thing that you know today. Yes. And yeah. So yeah, you don't have small. to solve this problem in six weeks. Your career is right. not going to end by Christmas, right? It might be a two-year or even a five-year project for you to master some Python. And the chances are that there are going to be tools that you can consume like Microsoft Word. You don't know how to write. You don't have to know how to write to, to, to write software to use Microsoft Word. But if you do, guess what? You become a much better user of Microsoft Word because you understand why it operates the way it does. And that as an infrastructure professional or as I say, human infrastructure – because we've got to remember that infrastructure isn't just about the bits that you touch or the bits that you buy. It's not storage infrastructure or computer infrastructure. There's human infrastructure in there too. So if you're a piece of human infrastructure, you need to know enough about each of – in the same way that in networking you know how a cable works or how you know a CPU or an ASIC or a memory module or a DRAM, you need to know enough programming to give you insight into using software, and that's the future of um, software-defined infrastructure. Fantastic. I think that's a, a great note to ride out on. If people want to know more about you and, and where to find you on the internet, uh, where should they go? Uh, you can find me on my blog at etherealmind.com. That's exactly as it sounds, ethereal mind. Ethereal is kind of like the ghosty, spooky thing. Yeah, ethereal. Seemed like a really good idea <laughs> 10 years ago when I started a blog. But anyway, and you can find me on Twitter under the same handle as that, Ethereal Mind. I'm also on LinkedIn and uh, that. But just go over to my blog at etherealmind.com and you'll find that as a bit of a landing place uh, for all of them fine social media. And of course, get on over to packetpushers.net and you can catch up with our community blogs and find links to subscribe to all of our podcasts although your podcast sounds pretty good too well thank you greg yeah and thank you so much for being a guest maybe we can have you on again in a little bit and we'll talk about something else why not we can always make stuff up all right sounds good <laughs> thanks a lot greg <laughs> Cheers. take care Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Special thanks go out to our guest, Greg Farrow, for taking the time to talk with me. I didn't get a chance to ask him during the interview, but I did email him and ask him what his favorite 80s movie was, and he wrote back, Blade Runner, of course. <laughs> if you want to know more about Greg, you can check out his websites, etherealmind.com and packetpushers.net, or follow him on Twitter at etherealmind. Thanks to Catherine and Patty for helping me pull this together. Big news, everyone. We are now listed in the iTunes directory, so please check it out and subscribe. If you're feeling particularly generous, why not leave a review? 
I'd sure appreciate it. Thanks to Lee Rosevere and Professor Click for providing the music for Anexapod. Thanks to Anexnet for helping me produce this podcast. If you're looking for a company to help you with digital strategy or technology needs, then I would recommend reaching out to Anexnet to see how they can help. Anexapod is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, which means you can share it, but don't sell it or change it. And finally, thank you to you for tuning in and listening. Without you, I would be a lunatic talking in a room to myself. If you'd like to know more about me and what I'm up to, you can check me out on Twitter at Ned1313 or my newly launched website, NedInTheCloud.com. Coming up next time, I will have a great talk with Scott Lowe about the full stack journey. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, IT moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it.